Mr. President, as a demonstration of Kenya's confidence in the Africa Development Fund, the concessional window, we are making a commitment of $20 million as Kenya into that kit. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a demonstration that for us to, to raise $25 billion, we need to demonstrate our commitment and believe in the investments we are making in this institution. Nobody doubts that investing our resources in Africa Development Bank is a logical, it is a, um, a profitable investment. I have since had the, I was motivated by the profits I saw and the dividends that will be paid. <laughs> and, and I think it's, it's a very worthwhile investment. I want to encourage um, public and private entities to equally invest. I promise you it is a worthwhile investment. The announcement by Kenyan President William Ruto was a key highlight of the African Development Bank Group's annual meetings hosted by the Pride of Africa, Kenya. The African Development Bank says the focus of this year's meeting is Africa's transformation, the bank group, and the reform of the global financial architecture in a year where the bank is marking 60 years of development work in Africa. Over the week-long period of the meetings, participants shared their positions and explored diverse themes around how the current global financial system has constrained the financing of structural transformation on the continent. On this special recap, I'll delve into some of the key discussions that shaped the meetings and bring you some unique insights from the sidelines. Great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2024 annual meetings of the African Development Bank Group. These annual meetings take on a special nature this year because it marks the 60th anniversary of the establishment of the African Development Bank Group. We are delighted that you all are able to join us on this auspicious occasion. I wish to thank His Excellency President William Ruto for accepting to host these annual meetings in this beautiful country of Kenya and the sunshine city of Nairobi. I wish to thank you all our heads of state and government for making time to join us for this special occasion. We are truly delighted that all our shareholders are here, represented by our dear governors from all of our shareholder countries. Your collective support, advocacy, and financial commitments to the African Development Bank Group make us who we are and afford us the opportunity to serve as Africa's premier financial institution. We are inspired by the vision of our founding fathers and mindful of our position and the role within the global financial architecture, as well as the responsibility placed on us by the African Union to mobilize financing for Africa's development. We carry the hopes and the aspirations of Africa in our institutional genes and in our corporate soul. Yet, as we make these efforts, we recognize that a lot more financing is needed to accelerate Africa's growth and development. The calls for reforms of the global financial architecture is necessary to mobilize even more financial resources to achieve Africa's sustainable development goals. The G20 Capital Adequacy Framework 
called for multilateral development banks to optimize their balance sheets, to raise more financing to support countries. The African Development Bank, Your Excellencies, our dear governors, ladies and gentlemen, heeded that call. We have been at the forefront of several financial innovations to achieve this. Last month, the African Development Bank issued a hybrid capital on the global capital market, the first ever by a multilateral development bank creating a new global asset class for investors. This $750 million hybrid capital will leverage three to four times to expand the bank's lending capacity. I am delighted that two weeks ago, the executive board of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, approved the use of the special drawing rights, SDRs, as hybrid capital, which is based on the proposal developed by the African Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. If the approved limit of $20 billion of the SDRs is channeled to multilateral development banks like us, we can leverage these to deliver at least $80 billion of new financial support. I would like to use this time to thank you, our heads of states and government, for the advocacy that you have maintained on this particular issue at every single stop, and also for the chairman of the African Union Commission, uh, my dear brother Musafaki, for all of the advocacy that you have also maintained, and for our, all of our governors for supporting us in this particular area. We are very grateful. Thank you very, very much. As we look into the future, with this optimism, we are also cognizant of the immediate challenges we must confront and overcome. Africa faces multiple series or serious challenges, including geopolitical risks, the broader effects of armed conflict, the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect, disruptions in the global supply chains, and persistent extreme weather due to climate change and macroeconomic instability. To compound this crisis, the economies of the continent continue to bear the burden of rising costs of servicing huge national debts, caused in part by high global interest rates and, of course, external shocks. I am, however, confident that the strong positive response by African leaders and nations to the Africa Union Agenda 2063 signals our collective intent to undertake radical transformation of African economies, achieve sustainable development goals, and unite our people in prosperity. We have what it takes to succeed, and current activities show movement in an encouraging direction. To achieve this transformation, a consistent commitment of substantial resources is required to invest in infrastructure, industrial capacity, to deliver rapid growth. However, we face the rigid barrier of global financial architecture that is fundamentally misaligned with our aspirations. We routinely borrow from international markets at rates far above those paid by the rest of the world, often up to eight or 10 times more. These rates are said to factor in something arbitrary called risk profile that is notably not applied when considering mineral ex ex extraction, even in areas of active conflict. It is safe, we are told, to mine in spaces where there is conflict but it is risky to lend to African economies. What a contradiction. <laughs> the debt problem faced by many countries, which consume the largest share of national resources and starve development agenda, we are a direct result of this unjust financial architecture. This situation not only makes debt unsustainable, but also undermines growth, prevents countries from investing in resilience, and denies millions of people, especially young men and women,
their fair shot at life's opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa is on the ascent, and I am optimistic about its development prospects. However, recent estimates suggest that Africa will require an additional $200 billion annually to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Moreover, it is becoming increasingly evident that the current global financial system will not be able to provide the necessary support to achieve the ambitious transformative agenda of Africa. It is thus not surprising that there are calls for a rethink of this framework to make it more efficient and just given a greater voice to the global south. Additionally, significant resources are being diverted to debt servicing at the expense of critical investments in health and education. This situation clearly demands urgent reform. Speaking with one voice many times, it has to be one voice, it has also to be loud and clear and effective. For that to happen, we think about working together, we think about representation, and representation is not also just numbers. It's being able to speak out loudly and uh, representing ourselves rather than having other people represent us. So it starts from what has been talked about that is very important when it was in the speech of uh, His Excellency President Ruto and uh, His Excellency Musa Faki. The, therefore, the reforms we are talking about is how do we disrupt, if you will, the current architecture as we have it. So that it includes significantly and visibly the interests of our continent. Our continent, whether it is the human resources or natural resources or any resources are thinking about, how can anyone interested in the well-being of the people of this world sideline our continent. In actual fact, if you look at uh, the facts as they are, in a few decades, the only place in this world that will be having a growing middle class is Africa. Mm. The only one. So it is even in the interest of the rest of the world that has marginalized Africa to contribute to the well-being of our continent because the growth of Africa based on this middle class feeds into the growth of the rest of the world. So they should even be accepting some of these proposals in self-interest. Because Africa grows, the whole world grows. But Africa cannot wait to be handed uh, this opportunity by anybody else. We therefore must be on the front line, really fighting for uh, this right, and therefore for ourselves, but also which contributes to the well-being of the rest of the world. President Kagame, I want to be a little bit provocative here. I've been coming to Kenya for probably 30 years, um, and there are places that I used to know that I no longer recognize. Why? Because the city's architects have changed the landscape. Now, most of the Bretton Woods institutions were created 60 to 80 years ago, at a different time from the one that we live in. So, 
if we're going to talk about reform, it's not just the access to resources. It's looking at those institutions that were created back then and asking the question, are they still relevant to the needs of today? What is your thought about redesigning a lot of these institutions to make them fit for purpose? Well, absolutely. It's a no-brainer that uh, what worked 50 years ago or designed 50 years ago, things have changed and therefore a rethink of a new design that fits the purpose must be into play. There's no question about it. But here what we are talking about is not simply an argument of whether you know this is fit for purpose or this. I think everybody understands that point. But there are philosophies, if you will, or interests or that operate behind that. For us in Africa, we are hard pressed to see that there is a change of this and in the design of these institutions. But maybe the way the institutions are set up, benefiting some parts of the world, those in those parts of the world are not interested in having the change happen because it gives them control, it gives them say over other people's resources even. So it's not that people don't understand, especially for Africa, we understand it better because of how it, we are affected. But the other parts of the world that have the power and the control, it's also not because they don't understand, but it is because that it serves them very well, benefits them, that they are not interested or they are slow in allowing the change to happen. So it, it's not a very complicated thing to understand. Everybody understands that. What is complicated is to reach this understanding and compromise that we don't lose anything by having everybody benefit as we should benefit all of us. That's the, where the issue lies. And therefore, the reforms are based on this thinking. We are only looking for the pathways to having the reforms implemented that provide us with less costs than uh, having to uh, fight so much over what is obvious that actually benefits all of us, as I said. So let's get into the specifics. Yes, a lot has been said about the inefficiencies of the global financial architecture for Africa, but what areas need to be tweaked for Africa to get a better deal? President Adishino outlines his thoughts. Being here for this particular session, it's a debate or conversation with you heads of state and government uh, about the issues uh, of the transformation or the reforms of the global financial architecture, the African Development Bank, and of course, Africa's transformation. This is one topic that I know is close to your heart, as you all have been advocating for the reform of global financial architecture, the reforms of the uh, United Nations, including the United Nations Security Council, and we just heard from His Excellency President Ruto all about that. And why is that being done, or why is that necessary? That's to ensure that Africa's voice is heard, that Africa's pri uh, pri priorities are in fact prioritized that Africa's financial needs are properly, properly considered, that there is equity, fairness, and justice in dealing with the most pressing challenge of our time, climate change. Clearly, the global financial architecture has a great role to play in mobilizing resources for development, yet it is not delivering enough for Africa in five ways. First, it is under-delivering on climate finance for Africa. Today, while Africa's climate finance needs are in the order of $277 billion annually, the global financial architecture delivers only, only $30 billion for Africa, a continent 
that contributes the least to climate change and which suffers disproportionately from its negative effects as we have seen in several countries. Second, the global financial system is not delivering financing at scale needed for accelerated development to meet the SDGs. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has noted that the financing need now has moved from $2.5 trillion to $4 trillion annually. Africa alone will need $1.3 trillion. With SDGs, of course, due to lack of adequate financing, Africa will not be able to meet SDGs by 2030 under the current trajectory. Third, the COVID-19 pandemic showed the huge divergences in financing capacities to deal with global pandemics and its effects between developed countries and developing countries. While developed countries provided over $19 trillion to support their economies during this crisis pandemic, equivalent to roughly 18% of the global GDP, African countries provided only $83 billion or 3% of their GDP. No wonder there is economic divergences between Africa and developed countries and even imagine market economies because we hear something about COVID that people have long COVID. But now also in terms of fiscal space for African countries, it's a long COVID in terms of fiscal space because it takes a long time to be able to recover from such pandemics like that. Fourth, the global contingent financing facilities have not been fair and equitable. Take the case of the special drawing rights as President Ruto has mentioned. Out of the $650 billion of Asia allocation, Africa got $33 billion, which is roughly 4.5%. In other words, those that needed it the most got the least. However, I want to really thank the IMF, I want to thank my sister, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, and all our team at IMF, and of course the IMF board, for recently approving the use of SDRs as hybrid capital, which of course multilateral development banks like us can leverage three to four times and deliver greater impact based on the model that the Inter -American, uh, African Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank have developed. We're very grateful for that support. I also like to commend the IMF for providing a third seat for Africa at the board of IMF as uh, the chairman person of the African Union Commission mentioned the importance of having more space around the table for Africa. And we're grateful for that as well. The admission of African Union to G20 is also a commendable development long overdue. Fifth, the global ar financial architecture is failing in dealing with the high rising debt burdens of African countries. While the G20 Common Framework is working to address these challenges and we support it to achieve equal and comparative treatment between official creditors, private creditors, and commercial lenders, the process, however, is taking way too long. Unfortunately, we shouldn't forget that Africa went through things like that in the 90s. The Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative also the highly indebted poor country initiative that just dragged on and dragged on. And unfortunately, we had a lost decade because of that. There's therefore a need for speedier, comprehensive resolution of dead bodies of countries. It's hard to run up a hill with a backpack of, sack, uh, of, 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 of sand behind one's back. So why globally the Debt Service Suspension Initiative helped to defy due debt service payments only postponed it. It did not solve the problem. There is need for more timely, comprehensive debt treatment, debt restructuring, and debt resolution for African countries. And finally, Your Excellencies, the rules of global taxation, as President Ruto rightly mentioned, need to be modified to ensure that they are serving developing countries. Cooperation across traditional tax rules is needed to avoid Africa losing taxes to multilateral multinational corporations that do illicit capital flows. And sometimes I hear a lot about illicit capital flows. It's not just African countries. In fact, quite a lot of multinational corporations have more lawyers, they have more accountants, they have more people than the whole country has. 
And therefore, we have to make sure that the old issue of profits, tax avoidance, and profit-based shifting is addressed. In my view, in my view, uh, if you do business in Africa, you should pay taxes in Africa. The African Development Bank says average real GDP growth is estimated to have slowed from 4.1% in 2022 to 3.1% in the year 2023. Meanwhile, real GDP growth is projected to rise to 3.7% in 2024 and will exceed the rate posted in 2022 by 2025, reaching 4.3%. Your Excellences, African economies are showing great resilience despite the challenges posed by climate change geopolitical tensions, global inflation, and rising debt, among others. The African Development Bank projects that Africa's real GDP growth will rise from 3.1% in 2023 to 3.7% in 2024 and 4.3% in 2025. Importantly, despite these headwinds, more than half, and that is 31 countries, achieve higher real GDP growth rates in 2023 than in 2022. And most importantly, 10 African countries are among the 20 fastest growing economies in the world. Looking at economic outlook of the continent, taking stock of transformation on the continent, but also looking at how to finance that transformation on the continent within the current context of the global financial architecture, and also some recommendations on what African countries need to do more and what the global financing architecture, the global community needs to do more to help that to happen. So here is the growth trends which the president has already summarized for us. If you look at GDP growth, in terms of re-GDP growth, Africa is doing very well, only second to Asia, with 10 of African, African countries um, amongst the 20 uh, fastest growing economy. So it's just a story of resilience. If you try to look deeper, you find that up to 15 countries in Africa, estimated to be about 17 this year, post growth of more than five percentage points. But we know that that 5% or 4% or 3.8%, 3.1% we have this year is not enough to drive structural transformation on the continent. Our estimates is that Africa needs 7 to 10 percentage of growth consistently for about 40 years before we can break the vicious cycles of poverty. And in this slide, uh, just to show that this growth um, trend that we are seeing in terms of re-GDP growth is also divergent across the countries, depending on structure of, uh, structures of economies in the regions, but also exposure to, to shocks that how they can be able to bolster all the global challenges that the president had already pointed, pointed out. And the same is the story when we are looking at different economic groupings, uh, resource-rich uh, countries, non-resource-rich countries, and so on. And funnily enough, on the continent, the non-resource-rich countries are doing better than the research-rich countries. Again, begging the question of what the president has talked about in terms of how we transparently use our natural capital to leverage resources for growth. And here is what I call, uh, when you look at what I call the paradox of development on the continent, where you have rich resources, high growth rates in terms of GDP, but low performance in terms of achieving, well, improving the welfare of people and also addressing SDG outcomes. If you look at one indicator, which is per, a GDP per capita, we'll find that the continent has not been doing as well as we saw with regard to GDP growth rates. The continent has trailed other regions consistently for decades in terms of GDP per capita, and that because of that, the growth rates we have have not created enough jobs for youths. There's persistent poverty, there's debt vulnerability and recurrent debt distress, but also several other fragilities across the continent. And then key drivers of structural transformation, there's quite a number of things that you can look at, but the president has already summarized it a lot, is that little blue thing on the ground, macroeconomic policy environment. When we get that right, all the other things fall into place deal with corruption, deal with illicit financial flows, and other things, and then you will see economies growing a lot better. Here is the financing, how we estimated the financing gap 
I'm not going to, to go into detail because, because of time, but just to say that we have 402.2 billion in financing gap for Africa to be able to catch, catch up structurally. And there are in those sectors that the president have already mentioned, which I will not repeat, energy, agriculture, and the rest of it. On the right side is also to indicate that we have this estimation for each country and each region. So please read the report and you can see what percentage of your GDP you need to invest in order to move forward. And I want to say that uh, I've been reading the outlooks over the years. I think this one uh, has a, a very important comparative advantage because it is providing uh, evidence based by uh, the countries. And it's going to become, if we're talking about voice and participation from the continent, this report can be uh, uh, you know, a very strong voice in uh, the MDB world. I want to, uh, before I talk about country specifics, uh, reflect on what Alexia says, uh, said, and that is, for the first time, we are hearing in the different boards of the MDBs a consistent message. And therefore, when you uh, put Einstein's uh, uh, um, uh, quote, it is absolutely an opportunity today as uh, the leadership in the different MDBs are really, for the first time, talking together in granular matters, not just uh, the vision and mission, but trying together to find solutions. And here, let me also commend Hasutu for uh, the fantastic work on the, on the SDRs that can actually open up the space uh, for particularly also how the bank can leverage private sector investments in countries. Now, when we talk, when I look at the report uh, and, and uh, you know, you had several uh, 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 slides that had conclusions. And here, I want to say that for different countries, macroeconomic stability is a necessary condition to be able to do the structural transformation. But given the successive shocks, macroeconomic stability in countries in general and in Africa in particular have become even, uh, I don't want to say more challenging, but requiring so much policy maneuver more than any time before. And uh, the quality of growth, economic growth and the outlook is giving us hope uh, is not enough. We have to look on the economic growth per capita. And we really have to have a closer look why there is such a big difference in between the income situation of uh, different parts of societies. So the question of inequality inside a society, I think, is crucial for coming up with better ideas for solving poverty problems. Um, there were some hints in value-add production, for example, in investing in human capital and so on. But I think that needs close reflection how we come to better uh, per capita growth. And maybe one, only one sentence on that. We have also to have a look on gender in that uh, aspect because we cannot exclude the potential of 50% of society that has a big impact of uh, growth, economic growth, and also has a big uh, impact on how we really fight poverty. Second point I want to comment on is the global financial architecture uh, debate. And I'm very thankful to Professor Rama that you were pointing out the two pillars, basically. The one which has to be done domestically, and the other uh, question what has to be done on an international level. And both sides are important. They are equally important. I, I want to underline that. I'm very thankful for your comments on domestic uh, resource mobilization. Uh, it's tax, yes, but it's not only tax. And by the way, it's not only that. There's a broad range of taxes which are not so heavily infecting at the end of the day than the poorest in a society. So we have to think about the broad range of taxes. Um, it's about, you mentioned it quite frankly, corruption. Uh, so I quote you on that. I think it's uh, very, very good that you were mentioning those topics. It's about illicit flows. So we have to realize that there has to be done a lot on that. On the international level, we have a lot of homework to do also, and I would agree we have to really work on debt release and do it differently. It was striking what you were saying about the private uh, creditors in that case. We have to work for including private creditors in debt release uh, and become more, uh, become quicker also with the G20 common framework because we have to address in a proper time frame also the needs of the countries. Um, if it's coming to the access to finance as a whole, uh, my government is very much uh, supporting uh, the reform of the World Bank and also of the MDBs because we need a broader range of possibilities to finance on the one side the issue of, like you were mentioning, global public goods, which are also, of course, domestic public goods. I think that's important. Uh, 
but don't do it on the uh, then stopping or hindering another uh, financing and development issues. The issue of succession planning at the bank is of great interest to the continent and the development finance universe. The steering committee of the Board of Governors met on the election of the president in closed sessions. And in the first sitting of the Board of Governors, the report of the steering committee on the election of the president was considered. So what's next? The bank is in a very strong financial position. So the whole issue of rebuilding is not, not that. Rather, we're being innovative. Uh, we've just issued the hybrid capital for the first time by any MDB, which was really well subscribed to. Very soon, as they are decision by the IMF, channeling through MDBs, when implemented, will also lead to the bank using it for hybrid capital. And so the bank is in a very, very strong financial position. Of course, succession happens. Um, there's a term that um, there's always a beginning and there's always an end. Yes, the term of the president comes to an end next year. And just immediately after this annual meeting in July, there will be an expression of interest sent out as approved by governors to member countries to begin their nomination for who they feel should lead the bank for the next few years. And as you know, the president of the bank is elected for five years and re-electable for another five years for a full 10-year term. And so um, the game is on and um, we wish the countries the best in terms of who they want to put forward. Very strong engagement in the bank in the last decade uh, to all those goals committed. We've seen that they uh, try to really establish and uh, improve their work on the ground. And that's something with the, what, is, with, what is really important for us. Of course, like in any uh, organization, we see that we have also room for improving in evaluating, in monitoring, in seeing what's, if, if the programs are effective. Um, that's where we want to stand side by side with the African Development Bank and come up to good results. And I'm very, very uh, confident that the process was laid out with the election in the bank now coming up for next year will be a transparent uh, processes and that's something what we want to see, transparent and fair processes. That's how it's laid out by now. I'm quite curious to know who will be the candidates, to be honest. Uh, but it's, of course, the decision of any person who wants to apply. And I've seen, I see that's a very fair process. Candidates can present themselves. And then it's, of course, uh, the decision of the owners of the bank, let's put it that way, of the African uh, continent, to come up with a good decision of a good next president or maybe also a female president. Still looking ahead, the African Development Bank unveiled its 10-year strategy which sets out decisive and urgent actions that the bank will take to support countries and it is underpinned by two key objectives. The first, accelerating inclusive green growth and then fostering prosperous and resilient economies with the high fives being integral to achieving these objectives. 10 year strategy, which is very exciting. And the 10 year strategy does talk a lot about transformation and the vision statement itself, which is a new vision for the bank over the next 10 years, it focuses on four things. One is Africa's prosperity. Second is inclusiveness. Third is resilience. And fourth is integration. So if we take all those four things together, we think that will contribute a lot to Africa's transformation. And just to say that we know there's been a lot of global challenges that are affecting Africa in a very negative way. But the, the, the strategy itself has a very optimistic viewpoint of Africa over the next 10 years, because we know we have this huge youth population. They're innovative, creative, and this is a demographic dividend and could be a de demographic dividend. We have huge natural resources as well. We're integrating rapidly and we have a whole process of urbanization going on. So we're feeling optimistic about the transformation of Africa over the next 10 years. Yeah, it's great that you mentioned some of the pillars that the, the strategy is standing on. But then the key part for people will be implementation because at the end of the day, it's one thing to think of a strategy. Uh, it's, uh, it's another thing to understand how the implementation is going to play out. And I'd like you to speak to that in terms of the philosophy of the bank in implementing its, its strategy. Well, well, first of all, I think the, the philosophy of the bank is that the strategy is about people. And, and there's a, a very strong, it's not, it's not about the bridge and it's not about the road. It's actually about the people. 
So this strategy and, and the bank itself, the philosophy, is to focus on the people. So that's first and foremost. And secondly, of course, it'll be young people and women. So this is what we're really focusing on over the next 10 years. But we do have our high fives, and these are our operational priorities. And that's Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa, Integrate Africa, and improve the quality of life of people of Africa also. To support the 10-year strategy, shareholders of the bank approved a $117 billion callable capital increase, raising the bank's total capital to $318 billion. President Adishino tells me what this means for the development work in Africa. The significance of the callable capital and, uh, and what it means for the bank's development work. Well, what it means for the bank's development work, uh, the callable capital is very significant. $117 billion of additional callable capital. That means that we can actually have more liquidity buffer as a, as, as a bank. That means we can take more risk on our balance sheet. That means we can deploy guarantees to be able to leverage more private sector. That means that we can also be able to use some of our resources to provide much needed blended finance um, to bring down the cost of debt. I mean, the, 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 the cost of financing for the private sector. That also means we can deploy more concessional financing to reduce the dependence of African countries on commercial debt, private credit debt, that has now become much of a problem. So I think it's just, it also builds our resilience as an institution. We are a triple A rated financial institution. We have always maintained that triple A rating as an institution. But this additional $117 billion allows us to be stable. You know, when you're on, when you're on, a, on, on a sea, if there is so much storms or sea, your boat goes this way. This allows us to stabilize, even with the headwinds that we face in many countries, so that it should anything happen to any of our triple A rated shareholder countries, we are shielded, we are protected, even as we work to make sure that ourselves as African Development Bank have our own independent, intrinsic triple A rating that is completely decoupled from our shareholders. And we are well on our track for that. Thank you. But looking at the size of the development challenge, solving Africa's issues will require partnerships and collaborations if we are going to move the needle for outcomes. For the first time in the history of Africa, African institutions have realized that they have to work together. Yesterday, we had a coordination meeting with all the financial institutions, uh, the DFIs that are there and the MDBs. And we have said and committed ourselves. This is the third session that we're having. The continental framework is there. We have got what it takes. And now how do you coordinate and finance these programs efficiently and effectively. I think the other point that needs to be highlighted is what we say at the Africa Investment Forum. We have this famous mantra, we talk about scaling up and synergizing. And what's very interesting on the synergizing front is how we as African financial institutions and some of our close partners are working so dynamically together in an unprecedented way. We, we if, if, if I look back over five years ago, I would struggle to say I'm co-financing very actively with various members on this panel. Today, the, the, the strength of my partnership with the Badias of this world, of course, AFDB is, is, is historic, but, but Africa 50, which is a, a fairly young initiative, we've done amazing things with them. And, we, and just during these AFDB annual meetings, I received a message from Africa 50 saying, velocity is very important. Scale, yes, of course, we're all working on scale, but we can't lose time. First of all, um, I acknowledge the importance of the milestone of the approval of the reallocation of the SDR uh, to a multilateral development bank. Under the leadership of the African Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, Dr. Akinwimi Adeshina, president of the African Development Bank, played a lead role in really pushing uh, this reallocation of SDR. I think it's a game changer in the sense that it would bring more capital into the financing, the financial system in terms of capitalizing 
uh, MDBs, and also other institutions. But what I've argued is that together with putting more money in the system, we need to change the mindset and the priorities, meaning that most of the development institutions should be focused equally on mobilizing private sector capital as they are focused on providing just lending, direct lending. There's huge pools of capital that are looking for assets in which they can be invested. Development financial institutions, MDBs, can provide just enough guarantee to cover the type of risk that the private sector doesn't want to take and let the private sector do the funding. In doing so, you can access massive pools of capital. I have also argued that institutions can take a bit more risk by focusing also a bit more on project development and project preparation. Because there's no point injecting a lot of money in the system if we don't have enough bankable project which will receive those financing. So it's about mobilizing resources, but also about changing the priorities and the mindset. Let's stop having institutions which are more comfortable lending money to government, okay, that is needed. Let's have institutions that have the same level of comfort in catalyzing private investment. It's not the same mindset. So hopefully this message will be heard. African countries are clear that, uh, you know, they are doing, they are taking steps to do the right things in order to create a, a, a business environment which will attract the private sector. And they want us to obviously support them uh, in that regard. But they are also doing the right things in terms of public finance management, in terms of domestic resource mobilization. Uh, what they are also saying, though, is that, uh, you know, they are you know, the drivers behind the, the position they find themselves in need attention. They need attention. And this is what we as the uh, African Development Bank wanted to highlight and also highlight our interventions, uh, you know, with these countries and also in terms of our dialogue uh, in the global arena. Access to financing is key for any kind of development and therefore reform of the international financial architecture is an important topic. Uh, my ministry, my minister are pushing, for example, for World Bank reform, which is opening up space for financing global public goods and not reducing the money for development. So to come at, up at the end of the day with additional money, especially to countries on the African continent. But that's only one small uh, portion of uh, financial architecture. We have to discuss about debt release. We have to discuss about illicit flows. We have to discuss about um, uh, domestic resource mobilization, which is also very important to bring countries into the position to use the money they own their, themselves and use it for the purposes they need. At the closing press conference, President Shino outlined the outcomes of the annual meetings, and I got to ask him a question about how the bank plans to mitigate the risks to the private sector, since the shareholders charge the bank to increase the resource mobilization from the private sector. Governors have charged the bank to uh, increase resource mobilization from the private sector. But in this light, I'd like to know, can we expect to see that the bank deploy more risk mitigation uh, instruments to cover uh, the risks that the private sector would not like to bear? And the last question from uh, Kenneth, um, Ken, is um, on risk mitigation. You know, the, what the chairman was saying, the new capital buff that we have will allow us to be able to take more risk. And one of the things that we need to take more risk on is on private sector. Private sector means that our risk capitalization rate will probably be going up because of the high, it's a risk return world. But we are not afraid of risk. We have to manage risk. And so we are going to deploy three kinds of instruments. One, a lot more partial credit guarantees to handle risks that um, occurs when a private entity does a business uh, with a, another entity, private entity, and they are not able to meet their obligations. The second one, we, and we've used that very successfully. We've used it for Togo to uh, raise ESG loan of about almost 450 million euros. We've used it to support um, um, Egypt to raise $500 million in RMB equivalent. We're using it now working with Kenya to try and see whether we can support them on their RMB uh, issuance that they want to do for Panda Bond, just like in Egypt. 
We've used this to support Cote d'Ivoire to raise $500 million uh, from inv I mean, for investors and credit, I mean, the uh, private sector. And so we will continue to do more of that because it allows us to do two things. One, de-risk the lenders so that they can provide financing for the longer term. So it stretches the duration or the maturity. Second is to reduce the interest rate, which will have to also help with the issue of debt. So yeah, we'll be able to do uh, a lot of that. The third one is political risk insurance. You know, we have um, the multilateral insurance uh, guarantee, investment guarantee agency, which is MIGA, or the World Bank is there, and we are working together with, with MIGA. And I think Ajay Banga is trying to make sure that it consolidates quite a number of instruments for mitigation under that. But the fact of the matter is that Africa is a very special case. And MIGA doesn't help us to do the political risk insurance that we need in Africa. And so one of the decisions that we've made is we will work to help create a political risk insurance facility that can de-risk political uh, risk that Africa faces. That's always the number one problem that investors will tell you. And that's why in our discussion with our governors, chaired by uh, uh, His Excellency, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, they endorsed the proposal that I gave them that we will consolidate all of our risk instruments. We will aggregate, we will scale them, we will make it easier to access by private sector and reduce the private, I mean, the transaction costs uh, for that. So we are hoping to be able to go back to our boards of directors. Um, and I think my vice president was here. I saw him, but he's not longer here. Um, Solomon was here. Yeah, he left. Yeah. yeah. To, to create, we're hoping to work with our board of governors based on what our direct board of, board of directors based on what our Board of Governors have uh, uh, endorsed for us to create something like work towards the creation, I would you say, um, of a uh, guarantee facility for Africa, which will bring together all of these instruments to be able to leverage more. Finally, President William Ruto gave President Akiwumi Adesina two assignments to accomplish before the end of his tenure at the helm of the African Development Bank. Our support for replenishment of ADF, $25 billion. We are enhancing our own support through enhancing our shareholding in Africa Development Bank. We must support these institutions. Africa Development Bank here, AFRIEXIM, Trade Development Bank, all the other financial institutions in our continent. We must give them the stamp of approval as leaders in this continent and support them. That way, they can support us. Secondly, we must believe in ourselves. You know, President Kagame warned me when he handed over the baton of this reform to me that this job is not very easy. And that uh, you have heard him say, we need to move fast. Luckily, I come from a country of athletes. So running fast will not be a problem. <laughs> My only worry is that we should not leave anybody behind so that, so that we can move together. And hopefully, we are all listening as leaders here that we need to believe in ourselves. Whatever, we must walk the talk. We must believe in ourselves. We must do this because it is necessary for us. We can never go wrong by doing the right thing. And finally, let me ask ADB, looking into the future, to give them two assignments. We need to write a new narrative for Africa. We have been profiled negatively for far too long. Please, if you can support an Africa credit rating agency that will be factual about the situation in Africa. Let me give you an example. We went to the market 
as Kenya. And then there was a situation in Niger. And we were told, you are going to pay two points more because there was a situation in Niger. Niger is very far from Kenya. You know? But somewhere, somebody sitting in Washington or some other place thinks Niger is in Nairobi. You know? So please, if you can work on an Africa credit agency that will help put factual information into the financial architecture so that this unnecessary risk profiling is reduced. <laughs> Let me ask you for one more thing, which you believe in, uh, Mr. Adesina, before you leave office next year, before you move on to another assignment. You have talked about undervaluation of our GDP as a continent. That in the calculation of our GDP, the huge resources, mineral resources that we have are not factored. The huge energy resources, renewable energy resources are not factored. The huge resources we have, having 60% of Africa's, or the world's actually, remaining uncultivated arable land is not factored. Our provision of natural carbon sinks is not factored in our GDP. And that is why most of the time we are told our debt is not sustainable because our own GDP is not correctly evaluated. Please, if you can work with us to get the true valuation of our GDP so that we can drive Africa's development in a positive manner. It was quite an eventful week in Nairobi, packed with top-level conversations on the call for necessary reform of the global financial architecture. Also, a big win on the approval of the callable capital, an additional $117 billion to the bank's arsenal will go a long way for Africa and help the implementation of the bank's 10-year strategy. We'll also be keeping a keen eye on the election process for the new president as the expressions of interest forms will go out this month. I'm Kenneth Bomo. Thanks for watching.